Fellowship this morning to our college service. Um, all you dear dear ones at home watching on Zoom, um, we welcome you. Um, I can't see you, but I know you're out there. So <laughs> just uh, want to welcome you today, and all all the folks here in the, in Bethesda itself, we welcome you as well. Um, what I was thinking this morning was, um, I don't know how many of you get the information sheet. Um, I always, when I get the information sheet, I always rush to the to the second and third page to find out what's going on this week, what's what exciting things that we've got lined up for us this week in service of the Lord. But actually, um, today I've just focused on the front page. It says, "What you know, our purpose? Why are we here this morning?" It says, "Our purpose, according to God's word, is to worship God, is to preach Christ, is to build a loving community and serve those in need." And help ordinary people become wholehearted disciples of Jesus Christ. That's our purpose here. If you're not um, a disciple of Jesus Christ, if you don't know the Lord, then our purpose here is to is to show you the Lord, is to open the Lord to you, uh, and, and in the hopes that maybe one day you'll make a decision um, to follow the Lord. And I hope that that today is the day that you make the decision to follow the Lord. Those of us that follow the Lord. Um, we have this duty to serve those in need and to help ordinary people become wholehearted disciples of Jesus Christ. So if you know somebody who doesn't know the Lord, um, but you think is ready to hear about him, please speak to them about him, please. Um, or ask somebody else to speak to, to, speak to them about him. Um, we, um, we are blessed this morning. Um, we've got an excellent band with us and um, Gordon will be speaking later on today as well and, give us, and giving us the message um, from God's word. Um, turning to God's word, um, we've been thinking in recent weeks about um, difficulties and trials that, uh, that will beset um, all people, um, and especially Christians. We're not immune from, from trials and difficulties. And I've been reading in the book of Revelation about the end times. Um, it's a Revelation is a scary book. It's apocalyptic in some respects, but there's a lot of there's a lot of of, of joy and love and love in there as well. It's it, it's it's about it's about the coming of the Lord Jesus. Um, this section in, in um, Revelation chapter 17, verse 14, um, is talking about the the servants of the beast, and they said they will make war against the Lamb. That's Jesus. But and this is one of Jim's big wee words. But the Lamb will overcome them because he is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. Brothers and sisters, that's us. Um, they will come when we are in heaven and we will be with the Lord as his um, called, chosen, and faithful followers. And we'll follow him wherever he takes us. And we look forward to that day um, being beside our King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We're going to um, re sing a, a wee song now about the King of Kings his majesty, and how he gives us what we don't deserve. Um, and Jesus took from us what we did deserve, which was the punishment for our sins. He bore them, he bore that punishment on himself so that we might be clean and able to receive his righteousness. So we're going to sing King of Kings. I hope if I've got the program right. Yes, King of Kings, <laughs> majesty.
Earth and heaven. we've got ahead of us. I um, hope you're looking forward to those royal robes um, because we'll be a royal priesthood in heaven. Well, we are a royal priesthood just now. <laughs> All believers are priests of the living God. I'm going to ask Paul to come up and open our worship this morning um, before, by putting it before the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Ron. Let us now come to the Lord in prayer. We'll start with the words of Isaiah. You, Lord, will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Dear Lord, today we come together to worship and place our trust in you and through our worship, grow in steadfast hope. We give thanks for the perfect peace that this brings. However, we realize that this peace has come at an enormous cost through the sacrifice of your son. We cannot imagine the pain and suffering of Jesus on the cross and the insults and humiliation that he bore, but it is the foundation of everything we believe in and the source of all our hope. In the words of the letter to the Hebrews, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. We come to you this morning seeking your forgiveness and confess that on many occasions we fail to be worthy of the sacrifice that has been made for our salvation. We often complain of the state of the world that we live in, but we do not have the humility to recognize that we are part of that world. On so many occasions, our sin, greed, and petty jealousies can add to the burden of misery in the world. Today, may the peace of the Lord come to us and fill us with the humility of our Savior. We pray that our dear brothers and sisters who are cur currently suffering pain as they get older, or from injury will know the peace of the Lord. In particular, we remember Bill McCauley, who was in hospital after a fall. There are many others we know of that should be with us this morning, but who cannot because of infirmity. And we pray for their peace as well. We also pray for the Sunday Club, the Bible class, and Midpoint. May the young people in our midst know the love of Jesus and be attracted to join into the life of our church. Let us pray for all the efforts we make 
to reach out into our community through the cafe, through Michelle, and individually to befriend and assist our neighbours. We also pray for the wider world that governments may act to reduce tensions and suffering, especially in the Ukraine, Afghanistan, the Yemen and Ethiopia. More than anything, we rejoice at the greatest miracle of all, that by your sacrifice you redeemed us from our sins and given us the promise of everlasting life. May we be filled with the gladness, with gladness when we worship you and give thanks for your indescribable gift. Dear Lord, we want to meet with you today. Show us how our hands may be made clean and our hearts pure. Thank you that through the blood of Jesus, we can be made holy. Forgive us, cleanse us, and fill us again with your spirit. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Thanks, Paul, for that excellent prayer. Um, let's see if I can make this. Okay, so yeah, notice for today. Um, so as I mentioned already, um, today's speaker is Gordon, and um, we look forward to his ministry later on in this service. Um, today's service is an all-age service with communion, so communion will be part of the service at the um, after after the message. Um, so um, obviously, please stay. If you do need to leave, then um, there'll be a, a songs before the communion starts, so um, you can make a a swift exit at that point. Um, On to the, oh, and again, refreshments are available after the after this meeting as well. So once we've had our communion, um, teas and coffees will be available. Um, if you're in the um, colour-coded areas, and um, please nominate someone from your colour-coded area to go for um, tea or coffee for your group. If you're in the social distance areas, then you can nominate someone from your vicinity to go and collect teas and coffees for you. Um, or if you wish to um, spend time in fellowship with someone from outside your group, then the cafe is available as well to go collect your tea and coffee from the from the um, from the counter and sit in the cafe if you would. Um, so not on this week. Um, unfortunately, this this um, this week's Sunday service has been cancelled. Our dear sister Nancy has been called home to be with the Lord, and our commiserations go to Jim and Violet and. And the family, um, but um, it's it's good news because she's in a better place than she was <laughs> yesterday. She's with the Lord, so we uh, we we thank we thank Lord for for her life lived in the service of Christ. Um, other things are not on this week because of half term. Um, the ladies' Bible study um, won't be on, and toddlers and midpoint won't be on. And the Men for God group won't be on this week either. Um, just to note that the Men for God group, when it resumes, will resume on the Tuesdays going forward. And the next one will be on the 15th of February. Um, things that are on this week. The Creative Workshop is on on Wednesday and at 1 o'clock. And the Clyde Home group um, will meet in the lounge at 7.30. On Thursday, um, Chapel Acre Home group will meet upstairs in the lounge at 7.30. And the Dew Hill Home group will meet downstairs in the cafe at 7 30. Um, then next Saturday, God willing, um, ladies' prayer works will be on at 9 30 and they'll meet in the lounge upstairs, and men's prayer works will meet in the in the cafe. Uh, next Sunday, um, God willing again, uh, at 10 30, the all age service um, will um, Ken will be speaking, and then we'll have communion following that service at about midday. Um, just wanted to draw your attention once again to the Hope Explored course um, that starts um, on the, a week on Thursday um, at 11 o'clock. Um, there's cards available um, from yourself, Jim. Um, these cards are designed that um, if you know somebody who you think might be interested in learning, learning a little bit about the um, Lord Jesus and what his life, death and resurrection mean today, then um, please take one of these cards and give it to that person. They're not to be, they're not just to be sort of distributed randomly about, they're to be, to be intentionally given to someone who you think um, wants to hear about the Lord Jesus. Um, let's be intentional about it so that we 
bring people into into this recourse who um, are open or potentially open to to hearing about the Lord, so that we can uh, hopefully in the future welcome them in, into into the Lord's family. So this three session series shows that Christianity is about real hope, a joyful expectation for the future based on true events in the past, which changes everything about our present. Um, as I said, that it's particularly aimed at people who are not yet Christians, and it's a good opportunity to bring along your friends. So if you can think of someone, bring them along. It's three weeks um, on the Thursday mornings, so it'll be on the 17th of February, the 24th of February, and the 3rd of March at 11 o'clock in the morning. Okay, um, I'm going to ask Gordon to come up and speak about all about Bethesda. Thank you, Rowan. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Um, in years gone by, uh, 2015 and I think 2016, we ran a little course uh, for those who were new to the church or for those who'd been around for a wee while who wanted to find out more about the official way that Bethesda works. And so we want to do that again. It's called All About Bethesda, and it's really for anyone, however long you've been uh, in or around the fellowship, uh, for anyone who wants to know more about the workings of the church. So we will look at subjects such as the centrality of the Bible. Uh, we'll look at the centrality of worship, uh, pastoral care, discipleship, how we go about all these subjects, how we plan and think about and conceive of these different issues. We'll look at the, the subject of fellowship and evangelism. We'll look at how we uh, conceive of children and young people's work and what we're trying to do there. Again, foreign mission, issues of caring for the community. We'll look at the governance of the church and how the authority systems in the church work, how the church is run. We'll look at finance. We'll look at uh, other doctrinal issues such as baptism and communion. And uh, we'll look at the subject of prayer, the prayer life of the church, a whole host of subjects that relate, as you might rightly expect, to the life and work of a, of a, a Bible-based, Christ-centered, spirit-filled, uh, believing community. Uh, and uh, if you'd like to know more about that, then please do come. We're going to run the little course two nights on Sundays, the 13th of March and the 27th of March, probably starting about half six, but more details on that to follow in weeks to come. Thank you. Okay, so um, we're going to have our next song. Um, there is a name I love to hear. Oh, how I love the Savior's name. Who loves the Savior's name? I love the Savior's name. I love to hear the name of Jesus. I love to hear people talk about Jesus. I love to hear people inquire about Jesus. Uh, hopefully later on, when we get God's message, we'll hear from Jesus' Holy Spirit as well. I love to hear from Jesus. I want to know about him. I want to know all I can about him. I want to serve him. So there is a name I love to hear. Oh, how I love the Savior's name. Feel my deepest 
woe. Who in my sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. people have gone to the classes yet but <laughs> I meant to announce before that song that they could leave join the song but um, if you like to go to the Sunday club then that's fine I uh, trust you'll have a blessed time there okay I'm going to invite Helen to come up and give us our reading for this morning um, it's from the book of James uh, chapter 1 verses 19 to 27 My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Thanks very much, Helen. Um, so, yeah, um, so last week we had um, Power in the Blood, and um, it reminded me of uh, the time I used to work for the Salvation Army, and there were some good, good songs that the Salvation Army sing, the, the Christian, Christian church, as well as being a a charity and um we used to sing power 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 in the blood quite a lot uh, we also used to sing an army of ordinary people as you would imagine so uh, i thought one of the joys of uh 
of leading the early service is that you get to choose the songs. So please uh, <laughs> bear with me uh, while we sing this wonderful song, An Army of Ordinary People. Good. Let's stand together. Come on now, let's stand. <laughs> You're kind of slow this morning. Come on, let's show the Lord we love him. excellent thank you. thanks for uh, enjoying that one it's a, a great song isn't it um we are the children of the promise because we are grafted in to abraham's line um uh through through the lord jesus um i'm gonna ask god to come up and deliver the message thanks god Thank you, Ron, for your leadership this morning. We appreciate you, dear brother. Lovely. Good to see everybody here again. Good morning once again, everyone. And uh, it's great to come back to the book of James uh, and to just have that systematic teaching that allows us to go through the passage systematically and to see what God is saying to us as we, as we build foundation upon foundation uh, from his word as it comes to us and to build a big picture uh, in one particular book or letter or theme, as we are indeed doing. We are coming then to these verses. We have verses 19 to 27 this morning. It's a, a tremendous passage. And what is really a fabulous little book within the New Testament, quite unique, the book of, of James, uh, full of this practical wisdom for living the Christian Life And in our initial session way back, there are four, four sessions ago, we looked at an overview of the letter. And then we considered the subject of trials, the trials of life uh, that is very clear these folks are, are going through. And last week, Jim helped us look mainly at the subject of temptation and how to deal with the temptations that come in trying situations. 
And so as we come to consider verses 19 to 27 of chapter 1, we see again that the overarching theme, as we had it read to us, is that we must learn to restrain our tendency to sin and to live in a way that pleases God. The context, you'll remember, as I've said, is that people are passing through hardships and trials, and they're struggling to live according to the scriptures. So I have three points for us this morning. Uh, In all the trials of daily life, we must, first of all, recognize our sin and part with it. (laughs) Part with it. Secondly, hear God's word and practice it. And thirdly, know true religion and pursue it. Firstly, then, we must recognize our sin and part with it. Remember, the Christians he's writing to are in this process of struggling with trials and challenges in particular ways that the Word of God wanted to highlight within the book of James, that God wanted to bring to the fore. It's clear they've become frustrated, they are irritable, they are an angry people, and they've fallen into various sins. They've stopped listening to sound wisdom, they've become grumblers and whingers, I'm grateful there's none of these kind of people here, (laughs) full of frustration and anger. It would seem they were constantly at odds with each other. James warns them, verse 20, as we heard, that human anger does not bring about the righteous lifestyle that God requires. And of course, he's writing all these things in his letter because he's concerned that they are extant, they're existing in the body of Christ. And he realizes that these matters have to be addressed. Uh, It was clear they were not living in a way that pleased God. Uh, And James says, verse 19, the mistake you're making is that you should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. So our heading is recognize our sin and part with it. And firstly, under this heading, if we uh, should be quick, uh, that we should be quick to listen, we should listen to the word of God as the rule of life. So in thinking of identifying our sin and parting with it, First of all, to be listeners, we should listen to the word of God as the rule of life. Verse 18 of our chapter, James reminds them, uh, just before our passage, it's the word of God's truth, that living word of truth, that has given them this new life that they have in the first place. But they have wandered away from a knowledge of of the truth. They've wandered away from the scriptures. They are so full of their own opinions and complaints. They are so quick to voice their objections and to seek to win their arguments. They are so hostile in their approach. They have no ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church at that time. These are some of the the sins that they need to recognize and part with. James says, get rid of all that moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. So James points them back to the word of God planted in them. Perhaps he's pointing them back to the Old Testament teachings, which, of course, would endorse everything that James is writing in his letter. He's he's pointing them to his own letter. He's saying, this letter is from God. You should treat it as the word of God. And no doubt he's reminding them of the message of the gospel, the core message of Christ's coming, of Christ's death, the purpose of his death, the forgiveness of sins through faith, the coming of the Holy Spirit through the resurrection and ascension of Jesus. That is why you can live a new life. He's reminding them of these things so that they might see clearly what they should stop doing and what they should begin to fully engage in as God's people. So we must be aware of thinking for us, just contemplating what this means for us, we must be aware of thinking that certain aspects of our daily life are outside the scrutiny of the word of God. If you are a believer this morning, Jesus, I have to tell you, is Lord of your whole life. He's Lord of every bit of you. He's Lord of you 24-7. And God's word, therefore, has authority over every aspect of 
our lives. The trouble with this new progressive Christianity, this uh, deconstructive Christianity that we're reading of more and more, and it's moving across the churches in our country. I was talking to Sid about this just the other day, up visiting him. It is that the authority of the word of God is being set aside for other voices, other authorities, man-made wisdom, and people are losing touch in church across the country with the voice voice of God, with the authority of God, because they want to move away from living under the scriptures. Now, we must be aware of that and not do that. We must bring our whole lives under the word of God. As James says, verse 21, let us humble ourselves and accept the word. Make room, he means, for the word of God in your lives. I always think of Mary and Joseph, Mary heavily pregnant, looking for a place, looking for a place that she might go in and have the baby. And there was no room, no room at the inn. I wonder how many inns they tried before they got that little stable. Is there room in your heart for the word of God to be enthroned as the authority in your life? that that word would be the, 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 the matter of rule and law for how you think and speak and live in this world. That's what God wants. And of course, it needs to be filled with the power of the Spirit. The word of God would crush us. We are unable to obey its legal requirements unless we are a people who are filled with the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God says in our hearts, I love your word, O oh God. I will perform your word in this life, in this man, in this woman. They will be enabled to follow you in obedience as we are filled with the Spirit and know this word and seek to live under its power and authority. Secondly, in this heading of needing to know our sins and part with them, we need to listen, because the, the whole theme here is about listening rather than angry talking. We need to listen to what God has to say to us in relation to our trials. Listen to what God has to say in relation to our trials. James says in verse 21, Therefore get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you. And then he has this odd phrase, which can save you. And I say it's an odd phrase because if they are all Christians, and of course he's writing to his brothers and sisters in Christ, they are Christians, uh, why then does he say that they need to be saved? What is it that he's meaning when he uses this expression? Expression, And of course, although they are born again Christians, they've trusted in Jesus, the Holy Spirit has saved them, they're forgiven their sins. The fact is, if you look at their lifestyle, you would not know it. You would not know that they belong to Jesus. You would not see that they were living a new life to the honor and glory of God under the authority of God's word because they were so full of their own agendas, so full of their own anger, frustration, their own angst about life, and the friction within the church community was huge. And when James says to them that they need to accept the word planted in them that can save them, he means that if they shut their mouths long enough and open their ears to the word of God, then God's word would save them from living a fruitless Christian life. That word would save them from wasting the new life that they've been given through Jesus Christ. And that poses a real question for you and me, doesn't it? What does your lifestyle say about your salvation, Christian, this morning? Do you claim to know Jesus as your savior? Yet, like these people, are you living a fruitless life as a carnal Christian? Are you full of anger and indignation and sin because of the difficulties you face? Something has upset the equilibrium of your life and you're unhappy and you're living with that angst and it's pouring out on everyone round about you. That should not be the case. Do we, like them, need to be saved from a godless lifestyle and a weak and shameful testimony. You see, in the midst of the trials of life, in their pride and anger and frustration, they had become unteachable. They had developed a sense of entitlement. Oh, how entitlement takes its seat in the church Sunday by Sunday in your place and mine. Does it not? We are a people who know 
our rights. And these guys certainly were full of the sense of their own rights and entitlements. They were frustrated with whatever got in the way of their agenda. Why was life so difficult? Why were things not working out? What was God doing? What, what were you saying the other day? That's not right. I Don't come and visit me again. And they had all this friction going on in their midst. And they had switched off to the scriptures. You see, when your heart is proud and angry, full of your own sense of entitlement, when you have no room in your heart for the Savior and his word to hear from God, then out of your heart, James says, James indicates, comes a stream of moral filth. And whatever comes out of your heart will soon come out of your mouth. You become critical, envious, judgmental, unkind, gossipy, irritable, argumentative, unloving, uncooperative with people around about you, and impatient. You give that, you ooze that attitude, and people are kind of, whoa. Therefore, James says, verse 21, get rid of all that moral filth. He doesn't mix his words, does he? Moral filth and the evil. He calls it evil that is so prevalent. Humble yourself, he says. There's the key, isn't it? That's the key. We lack the humility. We're full of ourselves, our agenda. And we've no room to be shaped inwardly by the word of God and the spirit of God to enable us to become like Jesus who humbled himself, denied himself, took upon himself the form of a servant to others. This is God's way. This is God's will. You see, when we humble our hearts, despite the trials and disappointments of life, God's word will grow to constrain you to be gracious and kind and to save you from conflict with each other. His word will motivate you to persevere through the trials. We looked at this in week two of this study and in a godly fashion so that he will save you from falling away from the Lord. I'm using James' idea of salvation here. In the tough times, his word will constrain you to, be, to live obediently and save you from sinning against your heavenly father. His word puts your hardships into context, reminds you of the glory that is coming and saves you from excessive sorrow. And his word, Christian, speaks mercy over your failures and saves you from despair, bringing renewed hope for tomorrow. Oh, the word of God, the saving power, the, the maintaining, the guiding, the keeping power of the word of God, not just to save us once when I was saved at 16 years old all these years ago, but today I need to let his word ring in my heart and the power of the spirit that his word would save me from being unproductive as a Christian, fruitless as a Christian, carnal, and allowing all the stuff that my heart is very keen to be full of, given the chance, all that moral filth that would flow up uh, uh, and, and I would not be living as one who is following Christ, but one who is living out of my flesh, out of my sinful nature. We need to know our sin and part with it. Get rid of it, says James. You see, God is at work through his word in order that it will not return to him void. His, work, his word promised his peace that passes all understanding when we cast our cares on him. You see, he will do for his people what his word says he will do for his people. And when by his grace we bow our heads and shut our mouths and are slow to speak out of our own self, that ugly stuff that we're all so good at, when we open our ears and our hearts, when we're quick to listen, then the word of God can work miracles. For in the storm, we can have peace. It's a miracle. In the trial, we can have confidence. And in our sorrows, we can have hope, like an anchor for the soul. Thirdly, under this heading of knowing our sins and parting with them, we should be slow to speak and quick to listen to each other. Quick to listen to each other. So much of the love that God requires us to show to one another is that we listen to each other. 
for listening is a way of supporting someone. Listening is a way of showing that you care for what is happening in their life. Real listening between two Christians who perhaps are traveling through hard times is one way in which the love of God and the grace of God moves from one life to another. Also to truly listen with the intention to truly understand the other person promotes empathy. And empathy has a great deal to do with unity. Where brothers and sisters live together in unity, the scripture says there the Lord pours out his blessing. There the presence of God comes down in such a place. And listening is a hugely important part of creating that loving environment where God is pleased to dwell. But to to listen to someone else requires us to have space in our lives to accommodate the other person. It requires spiritual maturity to listen attentively, actively listen to someone else. It requires humility and a self-effacing attitude that you're not just waiting for them to stop talking so you can start again. Oh, yes, I have. have well, Well, let me tell you this. There's no listening, there's no engagement, there's no love, there's no space, there's no unity, there's no fellowship, there's no warmth, there's no togetherness as Christ died to bring us together into that place where we truly bear each other's burdens. And listening with a mature, humble heart is such a blessed gift to be able to offer the body of Christ. Are you a good listener? How important it is, James says, be quick to listen. Too often our lives are full of ourselves, our own needs, our own accomplishments, our own troubles. We want to talk about our children. Oh, maybe I'll tell you about my wonderful children. They've done this and they've done that. And uh, and what else can I tell you? Yes, I'm doing this other wonderful thing. And and we talk about ourselves and it all comes out. And where's the Lord? Where's where's humility? Where's, Where's the grace of God coming through that? I like talking about my children, but... You know, there's a time and a place, isn't there? There's a time and a place. And when we're like that, we're incapable of of listening properly to anyone. Indeed, we are more likely to argue with people, to disagree with them. We we seem to be in disagreement mode, don't we? We find fault very quickly. There's something wrong with that. Or we find an excuse to walk away from them. Oh, I need to go. Sorry, I'm just going somewhere else. We don't stand still long enough to have an in-depth conversation. There's no room for you in my heart. Well, I want there to be. I want to listen. I want us to be a listening church because listening is filled with the power of the word of God. You see, James says to them as born again men and women, you should not have this stuff in your life. Identify your sin and part with it. This anger and frustration, this spirit of entitlement, this me first approach, all this complaining about life, a selective disregard for the word of God, and this arguing and fighting among yourself, it's moral filth, says James, and not consistent with your new life. Therefore, we must identify our sin and part with it come to our second point we are to hear God's word and practice it we are to hear God's word and practice it points two and three will be a little bit more brief than point one from verse 22 James says do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves do what it says Too often in contemporary churches, the exercise of going to meetings and listening to the word has replaced the exercise of putting that word into practice in our lives. We are guilty of this. It is, of course, much easier to do this, to simply listen to the truth than to put the effort in to put the truth into practice. And we gravitate towards the the least course of resistance, the easy approach. Let's think for a moment why it's so hard to put the word of God into practice. It's hard because our sinful nature is constantly at war with the spirit of God. Romans 8 tells us that our sinful nature is in complete opposition to the spirit of God who now lives in us as Christians. And while our flesh delights in godlessness, 
the will of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us as believers is that we should grow in obedience to the word of God. You'll know the story of the man who had two dogs. Each week he conducted a dog fight and invited his pals to bet on which one of the dogs would win. He himself always strangely managed to predict the winning dog. Eventually, a wee boy said to him, how is it that you're never wrong in predicting the winner? He said, son, I always bet on the one that I've been feeding. The, the other one gets nothing to eat, and he is bound to lose. In this tough battle with our sinful nature, we need to feed our souls on the word of God. Just what James is saying to this, this group of unhappy I rate Christians. We need to feed our souls in the word of God daily. We need to be filled with the spirit of God constantly. We need to commune with the people of God regularly. And we need to wait in the presence of God expectantly. And when we walk out our front door, we need to seek to do the will of God intentionally. If we do these things, we will win this battle and put God's word into practice. Secondly, it's hard to put the word into practice because we think it's okay to be selective with the word of God. It's so easy when we think we're doing well in one area of our Christian lives, maybe attending a group, maybe helping at the cafe, doing evangelism, playing in the band, or assisting an elderly neighbor. It's very easy then to say, I'm doing fine. I've fulfilled my Christian responsibilities. So we have a lifestyle that has one or two key areas where we are publicly seen to be living according to the word, but then a vast amount of our lives usually hidden where there is little difference between us and the non-Christian world around us. Rather, let's put God's word fully into practice. Thirdly, it's hard to put the word into practice because we forget the rewards of obedience. Fairly quickly, there is great joy and real delight that God pours into our hearts when we seek to deny ourselves, when we seek to pick up our cross daily and follow after Christ. Living with a clear conscience, living with a real sense of the Father's pleasure, living with the joy of the Lord, that is the portion of those who honor God. This is a great incentive to holy living. And we forget too that one day in heaven, one day in heaven, all our efforts to love God, to obey his word, to put it into practice, to serve Christ, to serve others in Jesus' name, all the efforts that we've put into doing it because we know it's right. Yes, it was inconvenient. Yes, I don't always feel like it. Yes, it's hard work. And when I do it, maybe there's little thanks and, oh, I don't know why I bothered and goodness me, but we do it. We do it because God's word says so. That Then there is reward in heaven that will be yours and mine for a, the least teaspoonful of water, the littlest drink that we give to one of the saints of God. For insofar as we do it to them, so we are serving, we are ministering to the Lord Jesus himself. Let's put the word of God into practice. Scripture says, therefore, cast aside every sin. Look at the effort that Paul uh, enjoins here. Cast aside every sin, every hindrance, and run with perseverance. It's a, a place to put in your best effort. The race, he says, that is marked out for us. And by doing so, uh, we will put the word of God into practice. I'm going to just skip a couple of my little short uh, subheadings here. I've said it's hard to put the word into practice because we don't see ourselves as we really are. And I wanted to pick up on James verse 23 saying anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. I just want to say take a good honest look at yourself in the mirror of scripture. An honest look at yourself. Close up like in the mirror in the morning. Oh, golly. Oh, my goodness. Look at that. Oh, I never saw that before, <laughs> especially as we get older. You see things, and you just don't like seeing what you see. You know, you will not like seeing all that you see in the mirror of Scripture. But we need to see it in order that we can take action. For if we address the things we see, 
it will be far better for us afterwards than ever it was before. Let's put the word of God into practice. And we have an enemy, the devil, who is seeking to stop us, uh, put God's word into practice. He delights in the Christian whose lifestyle is weak, whose testimony is poor, who takes no real thought for living intentionally for the glory of Christ. And it's hard to put the word into practice because we compare ourselves to others. <laughs> and let me tell you, dear brothers and sisters, when you compare yourself to others, you will quickly conclude, I'm not doing so badly after all. <laughs> and you will say, I can ease off. I can take it easy. I'll just go with the flow. I'll just fit in with the crowd. I'll, I'll go with the flock. We are sheep after all. And, uh, you know, we need to get our vision for commitment straight from the scriptures, straight from the Lord, to live for him, that whatever anybody else is doing, we will be all for Jesus every morning that we get out of bed. And my last point this morning, so we've, we've looked at, we must recognize our sin and part with it. We must hear God's word and practice it. And thirdly, briefly, we must know true religion and pursue it. James says, verse 26, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongue, deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Again, it seems that folks uh, James is writing to were full of religious pride. Yeah, James hits them with this body blow, as it were. He says, listen, the way you people speak to each other in the first instance, your religion is clearly worthless. Uh, and we've seen why, because they claimed to be religious, but it, they had no uh, godly lifestyle. There was no change away from their sinful living. And when I read this, I thought of the disciples of Jesus who argued amongst themselves as to which of them was the greatest, maybe which of them was the most religious, was the most effective in ministry. And you'll remember how Christ brought a little child into their midst saying, whoever wants to be great must become like this little child and whoever wants to be first must make themselves the servant of all. True religion is to do with service serving God's will, ministering to people's needs. That's where true religion lies. And um, in a similar way, James says, you're boasting about your religion and your religious activity. But here is what religion, true religion looks like. He says, true religion has two key elements. It is to look after the needy, such as orphans and widows. And secondly, it's to keep oneself from being polluted or sinfully stained by the world around us. On both these fronts, it's clear that the folks he's writing to are not practicing that kind of true religion, which James says God our Father accepts as pure and faultless. It's interesting that Paul says when we uh, put love into action, when, when we as Christians with the, the Holy Spirit in our hearts, the fruit of the Spirit is love, that primary characteristic of God. God is love. God is in us by the Holy Spirit. God's love is in us. When we put that love into action, says Paul, we will inevitably begin to obey the commands of God. That's the essence of part of Paul's teachings in Romans. This ties up with James' definition of true religion because firstly real love for God will keep you from uh, dishonoring God will enable you to want to honor God and will keep you from polluting your life with things that would be uh, displeasing to God you will not venture to live your life into things to get involved in things to see things to do things to speak in a way to have ambitions or plans that you know would grieve your heavenly father because you love God because the true love of God is in your heart and you want to please him. And so you look at the scriptures to know how you might live to please and honor God because you love him. It's not a duty. It's a delight because we love our heavenly father and we want to please him and how good it feels to please God in uh, our lives. And I know that personally because I know what it is to displease God. I know what it feels like in my soul when I've done things that I've known to grieve my heavenly father. 
and I hate it. I hate the conviction of sin. I can't live with myself. I can't sleep at night. My conscience is troubled. What about you? Isn't that the case? Isn't it so good when you sort these things out with God and say, Father, I love you. Forgive me. Help me to start again and to show my love for you. Keep me pure from the things of the world that in this world, the salt of Christ in your life and mine might not lose its savor but there might be power for us to live in Jesus' name and to influence our community, our family, our friends, our colleagues in a godly, godly way. Secondly, this real love that's in our hearts is a love for people. And when we love people, it will lead us to take care of widows and orphans. When we love people with the love of Jesus in our hearts, we will see a need and not want to ignore it. That's not the way of the Christian. We will see a need. And because we are people filled with love and compassion, we will not pass by on the other side. We will engage whatever the need may be. That's the kind of people God wants us to be. That's the kind of people that will be when we obey the word. And Paul says, be filled with the love of Jesus and you will become this person. You will fulfill the word. You will be obedient. And these things lie at the heart of what God considers true religion. And so our Sunday services and our midweek meetings are designed not to be an end in themselves. We haven't, we don't take boxes because we've done the services on a Sunday or or got to the the groups midweek. It's great to come on the Sunday. It's good, very good to be involved midweek. But these things are there that they might equip us to be the people that God wants us to be, to be truly religious in the eyes of God, according to how his word defines it for us. So God is equipping us to practice true religion every day, every week, showing forth the lifestyle of those who are the redeemed of the Lord. Let me close there. We've seen that in all the trials of daily life, we must firstly recognize our sin and part with it. Secondly, we must hear God's word and practice it. And thirdly, we must know true religion and pursue it. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word this morning. We praise you for this fabulous little letter, the book of James, and how full of rich teaching it is. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters as I pray for myself that your word would be sown into our hearts. We would accept it inwardly as James encourages us to do, that it might blossom, it might grow a seed planted, that in our lives we would live like Christ. And this would be for your glory and your pleasure. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Gordon, for bringing God's word to us this morning. Um, we're now moving into our time of communion. Um, so I've been asked to prepare a short, uh, a short thought. Um, and um, the Holy Spirit was obviously at work, because the verse I've chosen is uh, from Colossians 3, verse 23 and 24. Um, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. It's not about you, but I've had a really busy week. Um, started the beginning of the week with the hospital appointment and tidying my house and um, preparing for a group later in the week. And then I started a new job on Tuesday and <laughs> getting to work through rush hour traffic um, along the M8. There was an accident on the M8 and it was all, all very very, uh, very confusing and concerning. Um, I got there and then you're meeting new colleagues and you're learning the policies and the procedures and there's training on health and safety, um, which I needed. <laughs> and there's training on confidentiality and protecting vulnerable people and lots and lots of things. Uh, meeting the people that use the service that I've, I've been working at and meeting the staff. And um, 
looking after my looking after my family. My my youngest son turned thirteen yet on Friday, so I now need to call on the, on the Lord to help me because I've got four teenagers in my house. <laughs> so, so it's a handful. And then yesterday, hosting um, a small gathering for a couple of Harry's friends, um, where they went skating. Uh, and then came back and had their dinner and um, and spent time um, playing together. Um, while well, my wife Jean um, went to Edinburgh and left me to it. So I've had a busy week. <laughs> I had a busy week. Um, but in the, in all of that, whatever I've done, worked at it with all my heart, as working for the Lord. Not for my human masters. I, my human masters are really important. My new boss is a lovely lady, um, but I want to do my best for her. But it's not her I'm working for. It's not even the people that use the service. They're working with vulnerable people with profound learning disabilities uh, who need a lot of help. It's not even them I'm working for. I'm work- I am working for them, but it's not only for them I'm working for. I'm working for the Lord. Um, I'm not necessarily with the hope of the inheritance of the Lord as a reward. I'm not doing it for the reward. But we get the reward anyway. The reward is ours. As we heard earlier on, Christ died for us. He took our sins on on, on himself on that cross at Calvary so that we might be purified and have his righteousness imputed to us so that on that last day we can face God the Father and not be judged for our sins because I've said the punishment for those sins has been taken care of by the Lord Jesus. Whatever we do, do it with all your heart. Don't skimp. <laughs> Don't. Um, it can be laborious. It can be tiring. It can be um, cause you to pull your hair out. Uh, but, but if we do it um, with all our heart as working for the Lord, not for our human masters, remembering that it's the Christ we're serving. Um, I mentioned working with the Salvation Army earlier on in the, in the service. I've mentioned it once again. I've told, I've meant, I've told this story before. Uh, my dear friend, Jerry, um, who loves the Lord, um, would one of the tasks of a support worker would be uh, working in support and accommodation would be to prepare a flat for for a new, a new resident coming in. And... Um, if you went up to one of the flats that Jerry had responsibility for, that he was preparing, you'd find him on his hands and knees, scrubbing the floors and the carpets, making sure that the cupboards were all clean, making sure the beds were, were perfect and made, making sure the skirting boards didn't have any dust. There was no dust anywhere in that flat. When I did the flats, I wasn't nearly as good as that, but Jerry was, was very fastidious about it. And what he said was, I'm cleaning this flat for Jesus. And the expectation that the next person to come in here might be Jesus. You know, you don't know when your master's going to come. The Lord Jesus will come. He will come again. He might come this afternoon. He might come, in, he might come right now. He might come in years, in, in years in the future. We don't know when our master's going to come, but we need to be prepared. We need to have our hearts, our houses, the houses of this body prepared in purity and dealing with our sins, as, as Gordon said, forming ourselves more in the likeness of him. So when he comes, he'll, he'll, say, he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. <laughs> Remember, it is the Lord Christ we're serving. Amen. Um, we're going to have uh, a song just now. Um, during the song, the brothers are going to distribute the, um, the wine and the, and the bread. Um, If you know the Lord Jesus as your personal saviour, then please accept um, the wine and bread and share communion with us. If you don't yet know the Lord Jesus, then just pass. um, Don't be embarrassed. Just pass and just enjoy enjoy the place to come. We're going to have our next song, um, Jesus Christ, I Think Upon Your Sacrifice. And as we're singing this, let's think upon the sacrifices of the Lord Jesus on the cross at Calvary, where he died for us. It's a beautiful song with lovely words.
Let's just be intentional and reach out to Jesus. Focus on him. my friend what a friend we have in Jesus uh, to be known to him and to know him it's such a privilege such a joy um, I'm going to ask Kenny to come up and give thanks for the bread thanks Kenny I'm going to start off by reading six verses from Hebrews chapter 9, <clears throat> headed, The Blood of Christ. When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. <clears throat> the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremoniously unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, Cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God. For this reason, Christ is the mediator 
of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Know that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Now bow our heads in prayer. prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for the indescribable gift of your only begotten Son. You gave him up so that we might live. We come before you today, Father, in grateful remembrance of what the Lord Jesus achieved at the cross at Calvary when he shed his precious blood to pay the enormous price for our sin. The precious blood which flowed from the crucified and beaten body of the Lord Jesus is a reminder to all of us today that our sins were washed away when we believe in the finished work of Jesus on the cross and put our trust in him for our salvation. Without the shedding of the precious blood of Jesus, there would be no remission of sins, and we would still all be in our sins. We saw the true humanity of Jesus during the short life on earth, when he carried out healing miracles and nature miracles to help people who were in deep need. When Jesus died at Calvary, the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, signifying that the barrier between God and humanity had opened because of Christ's finished work on the cross. Father, we now remember on the night that Jesus was betrayed in the upper room, he took a piece of bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, This is my body. Eat this in remembrance of me. As we now eat this bread, we praise and glorify his precious name. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for coming to this world, a world that was in desperate need of repair. Sin had just taken a hold of the world, Father. We thank you for coming to this world, living as a human, and you suffered like we suffered, Father. We thank you for going to the cross, Lord. We thank you for the price you paid. We thank you for the shedding of your blood. Only your blood, Father, can wipe us clean. It can only be the way to forgive our sins, Father. So we just thank you, Father. We thank you for this wine that we take as a symbol and help it take it, help us take us with reverent fear and help us not take us for granted. It's a great time, community, Father, just to meet with you. But let's be serious about this. So in the same way, Jesus took the cup After he gave us thanks, he said, drink from it. He gave it to all his disciples. This is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of his sins. Oh, we thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for shedding our blood. We thank you for paying the price, Father. What a debt we owe to you, Father. We thank you for our time this morning. We thank you for this service. We just pray, Father, that there was someone who came in this morning who doesn't know you but knows you now who and has asked to come into their hearts, Father. We just pray that is why we're here, Father. Yes, it's great to meet with people, have a wee cup and tea after, but it's just, this is the mainstay. This is the important part of church, coming on a Sunday and just meeting and worshipping with you, Father. We just pray for all these things. We just thank you, Father. For this blood, the blood which it can only redeem us from. So we just take this wine as a symbol of your blood that you shed for us. And we just thank you in the name above all names.
our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks, Kenny. Thanks, uh, James, for those prayers. I'll uh, just close our service now with our last song, The Price is Paid. Hallelujah. What a joy it is to know that Jesus paid it all. He, hasn't, um, he didn't die for some of my sins. He didn't die for all the sins of some people. He died for all of the sins of all people in know him. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that the price is paid. And hallelujah, the price is paid.
thanks very much. That's the service concluded. Um, please stay for fellowship and um, some gin and coffee. Um, and I trust that you'll, you felt the touch of God this morning and that you feel the blessings of the Holy Spirit in all your work, in all your dealings, in all your activities in the week to come. You might know him and serve him in all that you do. Bless you and go in peace. Thank mm-hmm. you.